Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Eleanor Hawkins, and welcome to Tell a Story Time. The Library, a Magic Castle. Come to the Magic Castle when you are growing tall. Rows upon rows of word windows line every single wall. They reach up high, as high as the sky, and you want to open them all, for every time you open one, a new adventure has begun. The Library, a Magic Castle. And now, boys and girls, our very first story this morning is the old story, Little John Little. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was just the size of a man's thumb. And that is why everyone called him Little John Little. He was so very tiny that everything in an ordinary sized house was much too large for him. He had a dreadfully hard time climbing up the front steps to get into the house at all. Inside the house, it was even worse. People couldn't see him until they were almost on top of him. And one day the big mop swept him right off the floor and outdoors onto the soft grass. Oh, what a nice smooth ride, thought little John Little, as he picked himself up. Now after that, little John Little decided to build a tiny little house all of his own. He built his house of little twigs beneath a blueberry bush. He made the furniture from bits of birch bark. He used little pieces of velvety green moss for rugs. Every day, little John Little swept his house with a tiny broom made of sweet-smelling clover. Now, when the blueberries were ripe, little John Little climbed up a toothpick ladder and picked the blueberries one by one. He held them in his hand as most boys and girls hold apples. One day, little John Little was rocking in his peapod hammock. Just then, a ladybug came to rest on a nearby stem. Oh, you are so little, said the ladybug to little John Little. Wouldn't you like to have, have a little pet like me? Little John Little had been wishing for a friend. So he and the ladybug, whose name was Reddy, became the very best of friends. And from that day on, they went everywhere together. Now, sometimes they went on long hikes together. Sometimes they went rowing in a walnut shell boat with toothpick oars. And sometimes little John Little would swing in his spider web swing while Reddy pushed him higher and higher. Now, one summer day, little John Little had a real adventure. He had fallen asleep on a dry leaf underneath a shady tree. While he was asleep, the wind began to blow. It blew and blew, and suddenly the wind lifted the leaf with Little John Little on it high up into the air. It blew him and the leaf over the little house under the blueberry bush. It blew them over the big tree at the corner of the cow pasture. It blew them over the wide dusty road that led to the old mill. And then, with a gentle puff, it carried them down to the mill pond where the leaf, with little John Little on it, settled softly on the mossy ground near the water. There was a big green frog sunning himself on a lily pad. Hurrump, said the frog, and he dived into the water. Hurrump yourself, said little John Little. I can do that too. He took off his clothes and dived in after the frog. The water was so nice and cool. Little John Little had a fine time swimming around and around the pond. And then he climbed out on a rock, ate a strawberry for lunch, and drank some dew from a yellow buttercup. After that, Little John Little took a nap in the grass under the shade of a mushroom. Now, while he was sleeping, a cow grazing in the pasture came closer 
and closer to him. A mother robin on a nearby bush said to herself, Oh, I must do something quickly. Otherwise, the cow will eat that little boy up with the grass by mistake. Oh, that would be dreadful. The mother robin swooped down and grabbed little John Little by the seat of his pants. And then she flew up and away over the treetops with him. When little John Little awakened, he heard a loud chirping. He rubbed his eyes and looked all around. Much to his surprise, he saw that he was in a nest away up high in a tree. The mother robin and her little babies were right in the nest with him. Now, how did I get up here? He wondered out loud. I brought you up here to save you from the cow, said the mother robin. She almost ate you up with the grass. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. But please take me down again. I have to go home now, said Little John Little. Well, you'd better stay here. It's warm and safe in the nest, said the mother robin. And off she flew to find some food for her babies. Now, how will I get down, thought Little John Little. Just then, a mother squirrel came squirring down the down the tree with some nuts for her children's supper. Please, please, Miss, Mrs. Squirrel, will you take me down to the ground? Little John Little asked the mother squirrel. Oh, I'll be happy to, said Mother Squirrel, but I must stop and feed my children on the way down. Little John Little hopped onto the mother squirrel's back, and off they scur scurried to her nest in the holly of the tree. Now they all had supper together. Little John Little had a nut for his supper too. Then the mother squirrel carried Little John Little down to the ground. Oh, it was dark by this time. Little John Little did not know which way to turn to go home. He was trying to decide what to do when two fireflies came flying by, their soft light blinking on and off. When they saw Little John Little looking for the way home, they offered to light a path right to his door. But, but goodness me, said Little John Little, it's much too far for me to walk. I'll carry you home, said a squeaky little voice. Little John Little looked about him and saw a brown meadow mouse peeping out from behind a tree. Why, why thank you very much, said Little John Little, and he jumped onto the mouse's back. And the mouse ran scurry, scurry, scurry all the way along the path the fireflies were lighting. Ready, the ladybug was waiting for Little John Little in the doorway of his little house. My, it's good to be home again, Little John Little told Reddy. Little John Little was so tired that he went right to sleep in his tiny matchbox bed. And Reddy went to sleep too, in her flower bed right above Little John Little's head. And that was the end of Little John Little's adventure. And that, boys and girls, is the story, Little John Little. And now stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a moment to read from our big Do You Know book. Stay tuned. Now, boys and girls, I'm going to read from our big Do You Know book. Do you know all about the beautiful fall leaves? And we have them falling this morning right here for us on Tell a Story Time. Do you know in the fall, leaves slow down? Their green color is called chlorophyll and it gradually disappears. And then their beautiful colors appear. Do you know people used to say Jack Frost painted the autumn leaves? It wasn't accurate because the leaves often turn before the first frost comes. 
Do you know about the painted leaves of fall? The birch leaves turn yellow. The maple leaves are flaming orange and red. The hickory and ginkgo leaves turn gold. And the leaves of oaks turn scarlet. Oh, boys and girls, it's fun to pick and save beautiful leaves. And you know you can pick them up and put them in the pages of a book, preferably a very thick book. And then, you know, you can press them and they will hold their color and you can look at them all through the years. I had to insert that because I do that every year. Another part of our Do You Know? Autumn foliage presents such beautiful sh show. You know, it's such a beautiful show that it attracts thousands of tourists here in North Carolina every year to go and look at the beautiful colors changing. Do you know the fall is a special time with red, orange, and yellow leaves, blue skies, cool temperatures, pumpkins, apples, county and state fairs. Yes, fall is a wonderful fun time. Boys and girls, be sure and visit your library, any of the libraries in the Craven, Pamlico, Carteret Regional Library System. Check out some very good books on your very own library card. And please stay tuned and we'll be back with another story in just a moment. And now, boys and girls, get very comfortable and ready to listen to the story, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. <clears throat> Paul Bunyan was a mighty man. A giant man was he. He was the greatest lumberjack who ever chopped a tree. As tall as 20 buildings, as strong as 20 bears, as brave as 20 lions, as swift as 20 hares. Now, Babe, colored a shining blue like sunny summer sky, was as wide as the Missouri and 11 pine trees high. Oh, Jim the crow, oh, so they say, would fly from horn to horn. He'd leave one wintry evening to arrive one summer's morn. No one can tell how Babe was found, though many songs are sung of how Babe wandered into camp when he was very young. Paul Bunyan raised and trained his pet to carry, pull, and pack, and Babe would feel rewarded by a pat upon his back. But others say that Babe was found the year the blue snow fell. It covered tracks and trails and trees, and Babe the ox as well. His tail, they claim, was poking out from snowdrips on the rocks, and when Paul Bunyan pulled on it, he pulled out Babe the ox. Babe did the job of 60 men around that camping ground. He had hauled 500 logs at once and piled them in a mound. He dragged whole forests to the shore. He straightened crooked roads. He packed whole camps up on his back he towed gigantic loads. The loggers tell about his deeds around their fires at night. They tell of how he'd strive and strain and work with all his might. They say he could pull anything, a mountain or a log. But would you think that even Babe could ever pull a fog? Well, one winter's day, a fog lay thick on Paul's huge lumber camp. It made the woods grow deep and dark with icy, cold, and damp. The river fishes lost their way and swam up in the air till even Paul himself could brush the salmon from his hair. The little giddy fish got caught among the limbs of trees 
and there they tried to swish and swim as happy as you please. But Paul and Babe plowed ditches in the river's crimson clay. They both together tugged and lugged and drained that fog away. They say that Babe pulled rivers too, long curly twilly rills. They gave the loggers extra work when floating logs to mills. Oh, Paul would hitch him to a wave, then Babe would huff and puff until his master cried out, Stop, that stream is straight enough. But sometimes Babe was troublesome, as when he tried to tub. He needed at least a little lake in which to scour and scrub, and tons and tons of yellow soap and barefuls of cream. But when the job was finished, how he'd shimmer, shine, and gleam. Then feeding Babe could be a task. His mouth held bales of hay, and often, as you might expect, the wire got in his way. So while he chewed and chawed and chomped, ten strong men stood beneath with pitchforks in their hands to pick the wire between his teeth. Now Babe was just 100 when his strength began to fail. He found it hard to haul a house or straighten out a trail. Paul put him in a pasture on the very edge of town where he could see the people pass as they rode up and down. And Babe was very happy, for the children came in flocks to climb the tail and pat the back of Babe, the big blue ox. And that, boys and girls, is the story of Paul Bunyan and Babe, the blue ox. And now stay tuned, and we'll be back with another story in just a moment. Now, boys and girls, I'm going to read the story, The Boy at the Dyke. Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a faraway land, there lived a not-quite-big-enough boy. The land was called Holland, and the not-quite-big-enough boy was called Peter. Now, Peter helped his mother. He always dusted the bottom of the blue chest, and he always dusted the legs of the table and chairs. But when he tried to dust the tops of things, his mother always said, Peter, you are not quite big enough to do that. Thank you for helping me. Now run along. Peter liked to help his father. He helped him harness the dogs to the milk cart, and he tried to help load the cart. And his father, too, always said, You are not quite big enough for this job, Peter. Now run along and play. They always say I'm not quite big enough, Peter said to himself. But you know, someday I will show them that I am exactly big enough. Now one day, <clears throat> Peter's mother called him. Peter, she said, will you carry this basket of gingerbread to Aunt Drinka's and be sure to hurry home before dark? Peter put on his warm blue coat, buttoned his silver buttons, picked up the basket, and hurried all. Oh, he sang a funny little song all the way to Aunt Trinka's. On the way, Peter played his favorite game. He climbed to the top of the dike, the high bank that held back the sea. Without the dike, all of Holland would have been under water. From the path on the dike, he counted all the ships at sea. Then he slid down to the road. His wooden shoes sounded cloppity-clop as he skipped along. <clears throat> Not far from home, Peter saw his cousin Gretel tending her sheep. Aho, Gretel, he shouted. See me today? I'm going to Aunt Trinka's all by myself. 
Greta smiled and waved. Further on, Peter saw his Uncle Hans. Hello, Uncle Hans. Today I'm going to see Antrika all by myself. Oh, Uncle Hines laughed, tossing him a juicy yellow pear. You are indeed getting to be a big boy, Peter. Now after that, Peter saw nobody. Suddenly, as he skipped along on the road next to the dike, he heard something. He heard something like a splashity splash kind of noise. It sounded like water dripping. It was water dripping. And where could it be? Peter looked up at the dike. He saw nothing. He looked behind him, nothing. And then looking a little way ahead, he saw a hole in the dike. Peter gasped. If the hole is not closed up, he said aloud, water will soon cover our land. Whatever shall I do? And even as he watched, the puddle grew larger. Then Peter had an idea. He took off his fine blue coat and folded it, and then he put his hand into the hole, and then the water stopped trickling through. I have found a way. I have found a way, Peter said. Now <clears throat> the sea cannot come in through the hole. I will stay here until somebody comes along who can fix the dike. Peter waited and waited, and nobody passed by on the lonely road. He put his hand even more firmly into the hole. Soon now, he said, soon somebody must come along. Long shadows stretched out on the ground as the sun went down, and still Peter waited. At last darkness covered the land. The friendly stars twinkled overhead. Peter nibbled on a tiny bit of Aunt Trinka's gingerbread. He looked up at Old Father Moon. Surely someone will pass by soon, he said, for I'm becoming quite sleepy. And then his head nodded. Suddenly a bright light awakened Peter. He heard the sound of many voices. Opening his eyes, he saw his father and his mother and everybody in the village. They had all come looking for him. Look, said Gretel, here's a hole in the dike. Peter has stopped the water from coming in and flooding our land. And, said Uncle Hans, his hand was just big enough to fill the hole until it could be fixed. He was just big enough, said the schoolmaster, to know how very important it was to stop up such a dangerous hole. Why, finished the mayor of the village, Peter was just big enough to save us all. Perched on his father's shoulder, Peter smiled sleepily as the men of the village started to fix the hole in the dike. And you know, later, Peter snuggled down into his own warm feather bed. He smiled again. Oh, it is a fine thing, he whispered to himself, to be just a big enough boy. And that, boys and girls, is the story of the boy at the dike. And now I have time enough to read you this poem. I like fall. I like fall. It always smells smoky. Chimneys wake early. The sun is pokey. Folks go past in a hustle and a bustle. And when I scuff in the leaves, I rustle. I like fall. All the hills are hazy. And after frost, the puddles look lazy and nuts rattle down where nobody's living, and pretty soon you know it will be Thanksgiving. And so now we close our book of stories, but we'll be back next Saturday morning. Until then, this is Eleanor Hawkins saying bye-bye for Tell a Story Time.